the, the, the Chancellor gets others to do it for him, with one notable exception when I had my arms twisted. But it does mean that we've had the great privilege of welcoming here a series of extremely distinguished lecturers over the years. And I think you'll agree with me uh, that uh, we've been fortunate in securing some pretty starry performers. Uh, and of course, this year's lecturer is one of the biggest stars who, is, who, who we've been privileged to welcome. Uh, and uh, I do want to say, give a, an enormously warm welcome to Professor Nicholas Negroponte, who has crossed the pond specially to come and talk to us this evening. It's an act of enormous generosity on his part, however used he may be to circling the world at 35,000 foot. Uh, I have occasionally met his brother John in Washington, uh, who was, among many other things, Deputy Secretary of State at one point. Uh, but um, it's only uh, recently that I've had the chance of meeting him. Uh, and as you know, uh, there is uh, nothing more boring than uh, introductions that take longer than the lecture itself. So uh, suffice it to say that, uh, of course, we're extraordinarily lucky to have him. Uh, I need to remind you that he has a list of achievements longer than my arm. Perhaps I could just uh, uh, select a couple. He founded, as many of you will know, the MIT Media Lab. Uh, he's, I think, the man who gave the first TED talk hit back in 1984. He's a, a best-selling author, including his uh, famous 1995 publication, Being Digital, which I'm told has been translated into over 40 languages. Perhaps one of the most extraordinary things that he has achieved in a long list is his, his program, which perhaps he might tell us a little bit about this evening, uh, One Laptop Per Child, which uh, really is transforming the world. He's a successful entrepreneur, as well as being, as I say, an academic author, architect, development guru, and a big company non-executive director. Nicholas, it's wonderful uh, to welcome you here. Thank you for your generosity in coming, and we enormously look forward to what you've got to say. Thank you. I did give the first TED talk, but what people don't remember about it is it was two and a half hours long, um, without notes, with a lot of visual support. And then I gave another TED talk the next year, and it was an hour, and the next one was a half hour, and the following year it was 20 minutes, and that's where the sort of the rule sort of then became that people could only give 18 to 20 minute talks. Um, I will take a little more time tonight um, because the topic is a very new one. In the next six months, you'll hear a lot about it, um, but there's been very little at the moment because connecting people and internet connectivity is a business at the moment. And it's a very lucrative business, and people around the world are making a great deal of money in telecommunications. And if you look at the 10 richest people in Africa, nine made it in telecommunications. If you look at the 100 richest people in the world, half of them did. So this is a very profitable business that when you come along and you say it should be a human right, the one thing we know about human rights are they're free. And human rights aren't something that somebody buys and then gets more of. And I don't want you to get hung up on the difference between a human right and a civic responsibility because there are big differences, but that's not so much my point. In fact, if I were to sort of give you the end uh, statement of this evening, it's that I think the internet should be free worldwide and made part of something that doesn't really exist, and that is a global public sector. You know what a local public sector is because we heard tonight that many representatives or mayors or heads of it are here. 
but a global public sector is a very funny concept. The closest we really come is the United Nations, and there are some examples of, you know, other examples, but in general, the idea of public sector and global uh, don't automatically go together. So when I wake up in the morning, I ask myself basically the same question every morning, and that is, will normal market forces do what I'm doing today? And if the answer is yes, then you shouldn't do it because normal market forces will do it. So I've spent my life and sort of the work that I either did directly or people who work with me at MIT or elsewhere in trying to do things that are not the things normal market forces do for a variety of reasons. They may be counterintuitive, they may be going against vested interests, they may involve inventions that people hadn't thought of, but they then become perhaps part of the market, which is, is fine, and that may be how they uh, evolve. And the difference, you know, the difference is quite profound, is the difference between a mission and a market. And I'll talk a little bit about one laptop per child, but the people who were violently, not even, you know, subtle about it, violently against it were the people who led Microsoft and the people, the leadership of Intel, they didn't want it to happen because it was not in their commercial interest. So when they, quote, competed with me, they did it as a market. They wanted that market. They didn't want to see the so-called bottom billion not using Windows or not using an Intel processor, and yet they, didn't really get the difference between a mission and a market. And when you're on a mission, you have different interests, and, and they aren't the self-interests that you have personally or corporately. They're very, very different. So let me just take three minutes to tell you just a little bit of background, which I normally might not do of myself, not because I want to talk about myself, but it might, may tell you about sort of, or at least explain the point of view. Um, when I grew up, I did very well in art. I won all the art prizes, sort of kindergarten through 12th grade, and, and I would get this art prize and that art prize. Um, the visual arts, not music. But then I did it, sort of had a mistake in my life, and that was as I got the highest score in the math uh, that you could get for applying college. So I went to my headmaster at the time and I said to him, look, I, I do well in math, supposedly, and I do well in art, so clearly I should study architecture. And he said to me, he was actually quite a clever man and completely went over my head, he said, Nikki, I like pinstriped suits and I like gray suits, but I don't like gray pinstriped suits. Huh? I didn't understand what he was talking about, and I went to architecture school anyway, did sort of five years of so-called professional degrees until I realized that the intersection of mathematics and art was computers. It wasn't architecture, at least for me. That doesn't mean I, I love my architecture background, and perhaps it would separates me from my engineering and computer science colleagues. And one of the things that, that I learned certainly in design school was that incrementalism was the enemy. That you didn't want to just incrementally, that you really looked, and the best vision, if you will, was peripheral vision. It wasn't dead on foveal vision. And the other thing that sort of one learns in des design school is that perspective is worth 50 points of IQ. There are very many smarter people than me in the room all the time, especially at a place like MIT. But I think on occasion I just looked at it. My point of view was different. And one f sort of unfortunate fact is that we reward IQ much more than perspective, and sometimes it's hard to understand where perspective comes from. And then there are a couple of other points that perhaps, you know, 
put me somewhat orthogonal to the scientific and technology community, and that is that I think the best measurement of anything, the best measurement of success, accomplishment, achievement, etc., is self-evidence. And I cannot tell you how that is just not accepted. There are people in the foundation world who tell me we are an evidence-based foundation and we measure everything. And I say, well, then you must be doing small things. And they, they get very offended. I said, if you're doing something big, you don't have to measure it. It'll be self-evident. And yet you're going to spend half your money measuring these little tiny changes you make, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And they say, well, our sponsors and our, the government and our philanthropists want us to measure everything. Rubbish. They really, they'll tell you that, but they want big changes, and they want changes that will be very self-evident. And then the last sort of rule of thumb, and I kept telling my son this as he grew up, um, everybody can be wrong. Absolutely everybody in the room can be wrong, and that just because everybody says something doesn't make it necessarily true. So one of the things that happens in university life, certainly mine, um, is that there are few people who really influence you very, very much. And I had three of these people, and I want to quickly tell you about them because their point of view affected sort of mine. The man on the screen right now, his name is Marvin Minsky. He invented the field of artificial intelligence. It was his word. He coined the phrase. It was 1958. Marvin was a dear friend and colleague and one of the founding faculty of the Media Lab. And Marvin is the kind, was the kind of person who would always sort of think in sort of a meta way. He would, he would, uh, he would come up with these extraordinary sort of theories. I'll tell you one that actually, I'm being a little indiscreet here, but Marv, we, we had built a building for ourselves, the first building on MIT's campus that was called the Media Lab, but I was always out of the country raising money, doing projects, and I came back once and I was getting in the elevator in the morning and it was a packed elevator and Marvin was in the other corner and he sees me, he says, hey Nick, good to see you. I discovered last night why humans have sex. <laughs> the elevator goes silent because they want to know what the answer is. My, the door opens, my, I get out first and as I'm leaving and the door's shutting, Marvin yells from inside the elevator, because we have bad memories. Huh? <laughs> and you think about that, and you go home and you think about it more, and what would a perfect memory do to you, and so on and so forth. Doesn't matter if he was right or wrong. It just, was, it just gets you thinking. And the other person who, who, whoops, I lost, well, maybe I didn't, maybe I'm sorry. It's not the, uh, I'm sorry. Oh dear, did I lose power? No. I can't, I have a feeling this isn't directly connected. I have a feeling that, uh, okay, so let me tell you about two more people. This is a man, this is a partner of, of, of Marvin Minsky's. His name was Seymour Papert. He was the last colleague of Jean Piaget who worked in Geneva and you know about from your child development psychology courses. And Seymour was not only Marvin's partner, he was another founding member of the Media Lab. And me, Seymour, who was interested in human intelligence the way Marvin was interested in machine intelligence, he was interested in how children learned, hence the Piaget connection. And Seymour would say things like, you can't think about thinking without thinking about thinking about something. Unpack that, and it's, you say, wow, that's, well, can you learn about learning without learning about learning about something? Namely, could you learn learning itself? And if you could, that would be pretty, pretty profound. And the last person 
I'll mention just as an influence, was very important because he was my partner. I'm always listed as the co-founder of the Media Lab, which is correct, but very few people know who the other person was. Okay, you were co-founder, who was the other person? This was the other person. Jerry Wiesner was about 25 years older than I am, was a very close friend and colleague, but there was a little trick here. He was the president of MIT. Before that, he was Jack Kennedy's science advisor. But I promise you, if you ever want to start a lab in a university, make sure the president is your partner. And what this did is it gave us license to kill. We, we had basically a pioneer's license, and nobody could stop us. It was like driving down a highway far too fast, and the policeman stops you and says you're speeding, and then looks in the passenger seat and sees a gorilla and says, well, it's OK. Just continue on, young man. And this happened for the first 10 years of the Media Lab. We could do anything we wanted because we were, we, he sheltered us and we had at the time a great deal of money. So he helped sort of launch the, the, the media lab. Now, what was the thesis? What was the theme? And the theme was that the creative users were, would and would be the inventors. If you think of photography and its history, the people who invented photography were photographers. And if you think of television, the people who invented it, very much happening here in the UK, then threw it over the wall, so to speak, and people used it in one way or another. In other words, the inventors and the users were different. And my prediction, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, was that computers would be like photography. Namely, that the creative use of computers would push the field and invent it, and those people would be the inventors, which was, in hindsight, a pretty simple, straightforward theory. At the time, it was considered rubbish. But again, I had the gorilla in the front seat, and people couldn't really tell me it was rubbish, and, and it turned out to be true. So we built our first building and filled it up with about, oh, 400 people who had nothing in common other than wanting to invent. They were, some of them were musicians, some were physicists, some were chemists. It just went all over the place. There was no academic boundary. And the importance of that is extraordinary because we were also quote, an academic department. We could admit students, we could award degrees, we could hire faculty, we could give tenure, we could do all the things that academic departments of a more typical kind could do, but we were this atypical kind, which where we were both a laboratory and an academic department, which had never happened at MIT and has never happened again. It's just a, one instant that happened in the course of history. And the sorts of things we did, um, and I want to, to describe it because you'll see how this connects to the issue of connectivity, um, is we did things that were way ahead of their time. And again, they didn't have to be justified uh, in any way, including the number of successes that you had, whatever that meant, uh, per student or per faculty member or per, you know, 100,000 or million dollars of research. And this screen, which is not very telling, but the front and end points of the, or the beginning and end points of those lines are geographic locations and what those lines represent is summoning a car to pick you up at one and drop you off at the other. And it was a program, it was actually, its name was CARS, which stood for Computer Aided Routing System. I actually worked on the program. The part that is astonishing is that that image is from 1964. 1964, what, what happened in, you know, why were the next 60 years, why, or 50 years, how come 
It took so long for Uber to happen. And the answer is very simple. Uber didn't happen because a group of people decided to route cars. The Uber happened because five other things had happened historically. We had satellites that could locate where you were, which we didn't have till 1976. You had small handheld devices, which was relatively recent. You had mapping systems. You had text so you could communicate. So what I'm trying to say is that the, these, it's like the alignments of moons, that, they, that you could predict certain things, but it was the coincidence of them that made it happen. And I will argue that that coincidence is happening right now, again, for the topic of connectivity. Certain things have changed, are happening, and we are having, at least in the next couple of years, what, by example, happened there. I want to just show you two more, just by way of background. Um, this was a, a project, this, this project on the screen was uh, 40 years ago where we more or less invented the technology for a variety of them for touch, that you could touch the screen. And in fact, you could not only touch it, you could even push on it and introduce horizontal forces, which hasn't been copied that much. Everybody thought this was stupid. They wrote articles about it, articles that so-called scientific articles, peer-reviewed articles that said nobody ever wants to touch a screen for three reasons. I even came up with three reasons. One reason was that if you touch a screen, your hand will occlude what you're trying to touch, so it's much better to move a mouse down here and see it. The other reason was that the finger was low resolution and dull. And the third reason which was the most laughable buzz, is that if you touch a screen, you'll get it dirty. So most of you interact today by touch. So again, how come it took whatever, 30 or 40 years for us to not only realize that we can do it, but we're taking our pretty fat fingers and we're touching pretty small displays. And some of us find that harder than others, but you realize that you can do a lot more with it than people had predicted. So what are the kinds of stuff we do today? That was laughed, the touch was laughed out of the audience. Um, now I will tell you one that we're doing today which you will think is laughable. And you will politely not laugh me off the stage, but this faculty member is working on a project to build a car not from the 13,000 parts that are shown or mostly shown in this picture, but from one part. Now you say, well, that's not so hard. We'll 3D print it. It'll come out as one piece and we'll, we'll just have a large 3D printer. And the answer is no. What she's doing is she's trying to, if you want to call it design or build, a seed that she can plant and it grows into a car and drives away. And you say, well, wait a minute. That's really absurd. Well, you know, it's not so absurd. And she's already growing chairs, and she probably can grow a house. And then when do you grow mechanical things? And what happens, look at, we're, we're actually moving, we're coming from a, from a gene, and so she, and this, this is another one just to show you how crazy we can be now about the future before I back up to telecommunications. This young man, Invented, by the way, if you use a Kindle, the display on it is his invention. But he's trying to invent, basically, it's, it's, think of it as, as, as uh, synthetic. It's, it's, it's synthetic biology for sure. And, and what he wants to do is basically get into the nerve system of the brain from the inside rather than the outside and actually not only interact with the brain at the neuron level through the bloodstream, but actually leave things and deposit things. And one of my last TED talks was about how you could learn French by swallowing a pill. Now, where does French live in your brain? And sort of, could you deposit things? In the Minsky 
tradition, that doesn't have to be true. It just has to be provocative enough for people to work on things like that and as they are doing. So now let me get to the, to the main topic, which is connectivity, and show a slide that shocks Americans. When Americans see this slide, they're stunned. They don't realize that the United States is a rounding error in the world population. We're, we are a tiny piece of it. And the, for a variety of reasons, and by the way, you, as you can guess, it's gotten worse, not better, um, there is this belief, this belief in size, exceptionalism, and all the rest, but the connectivity of the world is not an American problem, it's not the issue in America, it's really about the rest of the world. So there's a, sort of a belief I have about computers that they have turned life generally into an omelet, whereas 30 years ago our lives were much more like fried eggs. We had this yolk with a sharp edge between the white and the, and the yellow, and you went to work, and then you went home, and then you you know, you played or you, there were, there were always in life very sharp definitions and most of those definitions have gone away or at least a lot of them have. All you need to do is look at your email, whether you get it on the phone or something, it's interspersed, it can be your kids, your spouse, your work, it's all sort of intertwined life. You know, what's a weekend, what's a weekday, what's, you know, it's, it's, these things are changing and because of that change, we are starting to see some some, at least in telecommunications, things that it's really about life. It's not about just education or just X or Y. And there is a historical coincidence which most people don't realize, but it was very pronounced in Europe, less the UK than the continent, but when the countries uh, UK was ahead of everybody else, but when other countries started looking at how could they privatize telecommunications, it happened at the same historical moment that wireless became plausible and eventually happened uh, to the extreme that we see it today. And that coincidence is quite important. I referred to the moons lining up before in the Uber example that different things happen. This was a, a, another one, well-timed in the sense that you suddenly could give other people licenses to run telecommunication systems because they didn't have to dig up the streets, they didn't have to lay the wires, whereas the state or the public sector had to do that historically because it took so much time, it was not necessarily cost effective. If you believed in universal access, there are other issues and the, the, that coincidence was quite important. But something happened. And here the UK and Germany were a little bit to blame. And that is that governments took the spectrum that we use to, uh, uh, you know, to connect wirelessly and decided they would auction them. And these auctions surprised people, surprised in the UK, surprised in Germany, uh, where they expected to make you know, hundreds of millions and made billions. Uh, in the auctions, and the government said, wow, this is a windfall. Now, I don't care too much what happens in the UK or Germany, but I do care what happens in Africa and other parts of the world. And those countries also saw this and said, wow, this is a way to get money into the treasury. We're going to sell the spectrum. Now, I cannot tell you how absurd I think that is, it's like selling Hyde Park. We're gonna sell Hyde Park to 50 real estate companies, the highest bidders, and we're gonna tell them you gotta manage it this way or that way. No, there's sometimes you shouldn't do that, and selling Spectrum uh, was a bad idea. Now people come and say, well, wait a minute. 
the private sector is much more efficient than the public sector. Let's, let's definitely, and if you look at the history of telecommunications in the early 1980s in Italy, it cost you $4,000 deposit to get a phone installed in your house, and it took two years to have it arrive, and so that's not a very efficient system. Uh, and so QED, the public sector, is inefficient. Well, one question is, is it really that inefficient? For some things it is, for some things it may not be. And to just assume, as we are, and I'm now speaking for the United States, who's going through this tragic moment in history, uh, where the public sector is really being dismissed. And so it's, it's, it's extremely shocking, but maybe it's not. And I pick one country as an example, which I think is the best telecommunications infrastructure in the world. 85% of the kids have fiber to their home. Every child has a free laptop. Every child has free internet. It's, it's just an extraordinary, it's owned by the state. The government decided that this is part of their civic responsibility. So you say, well, Uruguay is small, it doesn't matter, it's still an example. So Uruguay is my poster child for not just one laptop per child, which I'll talk about briefly, but also for, for connectivity. And it's very simple assumption that children are the most precious natural resource of any country. I can't tell you how many states, or nation states, how many countries uh, I would get the chance because of mistaken identity. They thought I was my older brother, so I'd get to see the head of state, and I'd say, sir, or on a rare occasions, I'd say, madam, children are your most precious natural resource, and it would knock them over. They would say, huh? I thought it was oil or lumber or something like that, and to say it's children. Yes, of course it's children. So in 1982, which feels like a long time ago, we did our first project in Senegal. Steve Jobs gave me hundreds of computers in return for teaching him most of the stuff he knew at the time. And we installed them in Senegal and other places. And we found these kids who didn't speak English or French played those keyboards like pianos. I said, this, wow, it's, it's, it really is something that kids can do before they learn how to read and write. You do not need to know how to read and write to use a computer and to use a keyboard and, in fact, even to write a computer program. So, flash forward, now it's, you know, whatever it was, 20 years, and I became involved indirectly with building a school in, uh, in Cambodia, and my son, who was living in Italy at the time, had girlfriend troubles and was sort of a startup that didn't, didn't work out. And I said, look, Dimitri, if you can suffer the indignity of working for your father, why don't you go to Cambodia and set up the school and connect it? And you'll see a satellite dish at the back of it. This is in a village where the average income was $40 per year, not per week or month, but per year, and uh, give all the kids laptops. And these kids took to it, and because the town didn't have any, elect or village didn't have any electricity, anything, the kids took the laptops home and opened them, and the parents were thrilled because it was the brightest light source in the house, the only light source in the house. So I thought, wow, what in this picture will normal market forces not do? And the answer was the laptop, because the laptop, there was kind of this nuclear war going on between Microsoft and Intel, where Intel would make a faster processor and Microsoft would use more of it. And the net net for the people using it was either zero or negative. And as time went on, the average price of a laptop was, guess what, it was $1,000, and it stayed at $1,000, and the reason it stayed at $1,000 is exactly what the market could bear. And the idea that it was much faster didn't in any way lower the cost, but it just kept at a steady state. And so I said, well, maybe we can break that spell, and maybe we can 
introduce a different concept, and in this case, my partner was Kofi Annan. We started uh, with the United Nations a project to build a so-called $100 laptop. And people, including Steve Jobs, kept saying, oh, that's impossible, Nicholas, you can't do it. Um, and what they really meant was they didn't want it to happen. And so it did, it's happened, we designed, uh, it never got below $150 in, in sort of its, its cost, its cost and its price were the same, but we made and delivered three million of them in the first year of its operation. Now, if I were starting a company and told you I could sell three million laptops in the first year, you'd queue up to be my investor. But this was a nonprofit. We all the money we had to support it was philanthropic money, and the cost to do it was from the treasury of the country. And after doing three million, I realized we had a trump card that nobody would ever play in the business world, and that was I could go and my. Uh, First case was in Brazil when Lula was president, and I said to him, look, I'll help you write the tender for the, he was gonna do a million laptops, and we'll bid on it and we'll publish in the newspapers what our price will be, which people don't do. They, they do these tenders and they keep them secret because they wanna win, but we publish and in the case of Brazil, because of the conditions and the servicing and the connectivity that was needed, it cost $182, if I remember correctly. And the company that won it, won it for, guess what, $181. And I thought, wow, we don't want to build and ship laptops. That's the last thing we want to do. We just want to force that price way, way down. And we continued for the next two or three years bidding in every country around the world that would offer a tender and we'd publish our price and somebody else would come in below it. Wonderful scheme, generated about 50 million laptops. A couple of cases we won accidentally. Um, <laughs> In Nicaragua, we won. We did it. We did. We were very happy to win because we were always publishing an honest number, so it wasn't fake, and people knew it. So that's that was the important piece of history. And as a project, it's it's perhaps the most photogenic thing I've ever done in my life. And this that the it was Australia it was the previous picture. This is Afghanistan. This is Peru. Look at the expression on that young. I'll go back one. Look at the expression on the young girl's face. I mean, talk about a different way of thinking about learning. It was, it was quite something. So, I, I ran an experiment after doing one laptop per child, which was very different because we had done the laptop through governments and through schools. Excuse me for a second. So the experiment was much smaller. It wasn't three million or a number. It was in two Ethiopian villages, each of which had roughly 25 kids in what would have been school from, let's say, you know, grades one to eight. But these villages had no school, had no literacy in the village. Nobody knew how to read or write. No words were anywhere in the villages. There were no magazines, newspapers. There weren't even road signs. Um, and so the closest you could get to finding a word, because people would call me on this and say, you know, are you sure? And it turned out that clothing, some clothing had labels on it, which did have a little bit of text. But basically the village had no comprehension or even remotely sort of understand about literacy in general. So what we did is we took, in this case, tablets, and we took as many tablets as there were kids and left them at the edge of the village in closed boxes. Now, the night before, an adult went in and showed somebody in the village how to put a solar panel outside versus inside and connect a battery so that it could create power but the rest was without instructions, without people, without anything. Now, these tablets 
had software in them that sort of monitored their own use. And so we could tell after the fact how long it took, which was about you know, an hour or two hours, for the first kid to find the first, or open the box and find the on-off switch. Non-trivial. The on-off switch, not only because these had it on the back, but just in general, the concept of an on-off switch is not self-evident. It took them five days to be using an average of 50, five zero apps per child per day using the tablets for seven hours. And that was how long they would run before they had to be recharged. And you couldn't charge them while using them in this case. Within two weeks, they were singing ABC songs. And within six months, they hacked Android. <laughs> okay. And I'm not inventing this. It's absolutely true. And the, the kids, uh, again, these are very photogenic, but the next picture is the best picture I've had in my entire professional career. It's not a great photograph, it's photographs, but remember, there's no school, there's no teacher, there's nobody who even knows what school is, let alone can read or write. And the kid on the right has nominated himself teacher. What, what what possessed them to get together to do it is unknown. Each of the kids in the photograph is using the tablet for a different purpose. And if you look at the kid on the left, he's using the other kids, and the other kids using the other kids. And these kids all read and write English and uh, are fluent in, in English today. So this happened without a teacher, without a school, and you know, you say, where, where is this coming from? I don't advocate that we don't build schools and we do it this way, but there are three to 500 million kids who don't go to school because there isn't one. So it's, it's, there, there isn't one within a short enough distance. I mean, if there's one 30 miles away, that doesn't count. So this was, to me, a, a, a very important experiment. I made a mistake. I, described people, because I'm always a little too open and enthusiastic, and I was so enthusiastic about this, the press started chartering helicopters to go to this remote village, and the kids proceeded to give press conferences. So it was a little polluted as an, er as an experiment, but here's a kid showing some reporter uh, that she can write words in the dirt. So again, talk about Things. So I look at this and I say, what will market forces not do this time? And it's the issue not about the next 1.5 billion people. You hear all sorts, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, uh, all of the successful computer tycoons that have emerged recently and they talk about connecting the next 1.5 billion people. That's trivial. The next 1.5 people, I can do a little price changing, I can do this and that, and they're there. The last 1.5 billion people are really interesting because they're illiterate, they're rural, they, you know, they, they're not connected. So as a first step, I thought, well, let's, let's connect them. And so let's find a way again, and what are some of the solutions? And here's some of the solutions, and I will uh, end in about three minutes. So prepare yourself for questions. Um, one solution is, is just what I'm doing tonight. There are gonna be a few hundred of you who are gonna go home and are gonna think about it. You're gonna tell your friends, you're gonna tell your family, and me are gonna say, well, maybe, Maybe this is the right thing to do. Well, it's a little hard to do this 200, 300 people at a time, but it's, it's part of it. It's part of the advocacy. And in my case, a partner fell out of the sky, literally and metaphorically. I, was, I didn't get a personal phone call, but the Pope decided human rights and connectivity that's a pretty good idea. Now, I'm not into Catholicism or particularly concerned about Christianity, but as a spokesperson, this particular pope is pretty good. 
So what did he do? He organized, a couple of weeks ago, a meeting in Rome of 40 people, more or less of my choosing, and came out with a statement about connectivity and human rights. That it hasn't hit the press, but it's not secret. The Secretary General of the UN just saw it the other day, and basically it's about the things I've been saying, plus, if you read the last paragraph, he has advocated creating a world connectivity organization, which is a little bit like the World Food Program, the purpose of which is to connect people free and make that, sadly, I don't have a better place to put it than the United Nations, but you know, we've got to make the United Nations work. Uh, somehow we don't have anything else that approximates what I call in the beginning global civics. So whether it keeps that name, um, how it emerges, it'll happen in the next six months, and you can tell your friends you heard it here first, because um, I don't, it hasn't been widely published. And then the other thing you've got to do, and I learned this from one laptop per child, you've got to come up with a plausible solution because the telecommunications industry believes, and it probably will, but it believes that it's gonna spend $450 billion over the next five years, which is an awful lot of money to be spending. Don't ask me why they didn't round it up to 500, but at any rate, 450. And that's a lot of money, but it can be done for 10 billion. It can be done for a lot less money. And you're gonna to have to trust me for a second that it can be done for 10 billion. And what is 10 billion? 10 billion is what the United States spends in five weeks in Afghanistan where we shouldn't be in the first place. So just Afghanistan, five weeks, 10 billion. So if money's fungible, which it isn't always, but it could be, and there are these numbers when you think of them at a global scale are not so bad. Now, What's the coincidence historically? Just like wireless and pri privatization, like the Uber story, I think the coincidence is that low Earth orbiting satellites are really possible and they're gonna start proliferating. And these are satellites that aren't at the geostationary very high altitude, but they're much lower and they're going around and the closer they are to Earth, the faster they have to go, and there's all sorts of geometries. But one of the things that, again, nobody mentions it's because it's so obvious, and that is they're global. We've never had a telecommunications geometry in the history of mankind that was global when you launched it. And by that I mean you launch these constellations and that satellite's moving. So if your market is London, it's, it still has to go all the way around and come back the other side before it's over London. So as those satellites do that, they're going over the whole world. It's a per square inch solution. It's not you know, a satellite where we're trying to broadcast or terrestrial system where we're trying to broadcast to a particular market because the market is potentially uh, a good one. So this is new. It, there are several uh, being proposed, some designed. Uh, there was one, a very old one. The point being that it's, 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 it's the new kid on the block. So take that new kid on the block, the Pope is your partner, and doing a few more lectures like this, and maybe the internet will be free. So, thank you very much. Well, if there isn't a host of questions after that, I don't know this audience. Thank you, Nicholas, very much. Uh, you've kindly intimated that you might uh, be up for ask, answering a few questions. Could I make my usual plea? State your name, a short comment, a question, but no speeches, please. We've got a queue. And we've got people with <laughs> mics round the hall. Yes, sir, you uh, kick us off. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much for a very stimulating lecture. I'm Tony McAllister. Um, you seem a bit sniffy about the private sector, and you mentioned that the, uh, the, the $1,000 laptop was around for a very long time. But it got there in the end. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I bought a new Asus tablet for £70, $100. So uh, eventually the economies of scale brought the price of the tablet down to that sort of level. And, and then it's up to governments around the world, isn't it, to decide whether they want to implement these sort of programs or not. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the hardware is now cheap enough. You've mentioned satellites. The satellites are now there. So um, uh, 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 you shouldn't be too down on the private sector, I don't think. Well, you're, you're correct. I. Uh, uh have changed my opinion a little bit about the private sector for two reasons. And uh, it's not to just become a raving socialist at the end of your life. It's really about two observations that have didn't really dawn on me until relatively recently. Um, let me describe the Media Lab as a place that graduates 50 students per year, PhDs or MSs. And that number, maybe it's 40 if I took it historical average. But of the 50, I used to count on half of those people working on big, long, hard-term problems. Whether it was to eliminate poverty or to do nuclear fusion, whatever it was. And today, out of the 50, one does that. So what do the other 49 do? So out of the 49, they do one of two things. They work for Google, Apple, Microsoft, the big, you know, really big Facebook companies who pay them now. The going rate, if you have a PhD from the Media Lab, is a million dollars a year. I mean, you step out of the lab, that's one hell of a salary. They go there, and what happens to their research? It gets locked up. It doesn't get shared. If you look at the company who's been the least supportive of science and technology, let alone universities, blah, 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 it's Apple. Apple is the worst of the worst. They've given nothing back. So I resent that in, the private, in that half of the private. They don't give it back. They lock it up. So I'm annoyed about that. And the other thing, what do the other half of those students do? Well, what they do is they start these stupid little startup companies that they have been encouraged to do to be entrepreneurial, and most of them are very small topics, and they get venture capitalists to come and tell them to focus, which is the new F word, and makes a small idea smaller. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I see the big companies receding, and I see a lot of talent sucked out for these sort of irrelevant things in the name of a form of capitalism which suddenly isn't working. We haven't, we've told people, and I can speak to the United States more than Europe, but I do carry an EU passport, so I think I can say it's happening also in Europe. We have told our kids that the public sector is not for winners. And I say, what? What are you talking about? When I graduated, the highest form was to be in the public sector. And so when you do that for a long enough time, and you think that everything's competition, everything is this, and shareholder value, yes, I do sour on it I, a little bit. I hear you loud and clear. You do need a strong competitive process, and that strong competitive process will Let's take our respective militaries. Not that I'm so fond of military, but it's a single military system and then subconscious and bids and gets the best, you know. So maybe telecommunications, that's the model, like sort of maybe public education or something. And yes, all of the constituent parts are gonna go through the private sector and normal competitive process. Thank Sorry you. for such a long answer, but it's, uh, you, sir. it's a very good question. Uh, Third row back. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Daniel Patterson. Um, I have a question about the <coughs> impact of the 
globalizing effect of 10 billion laptops uh, across the world. It, we're having a problem at the moment with nationalism um, in Europe, arguably in North America. Um, and it seems to me that by doing this, you're going to create a whole new generation of globalized citizens that don't respond to national edicts, possibly, because this is going to upset some national governments, your idea. And in the long term, you could see a clash between the current global north and current global south in terms of competition for jobs and competencies. I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. Well, let me tease that into at least two pieces because um, as you can guess, uh, I think of nationalism as a disease and as a disease that is unfortunately spreading. I don't consider myself a citizen of any country um, and it's, you know, I, I just, you know, dreadfully sad about what's happening around the world, in the United States, in the UK, or all over the place. And you say, well, maybe this is just a little blip in history, and maybe we, we aren't, we don't need to be that nationalistic. And the North-South divide, there's a lot of South-South stuff going on that is quite extraordinary. Um, in the case of, of Uruguay, spending, a lot of the Uruguayans go to Ethiopia and Rwanda to, to basically share what they've learned and to set up systems. And we're now finding Rwandans doing things in other parts of Africa. And, you know, if nationalism is disease, maybe globalism can become one again. I think that the confusion between jobs and nationalism is, is a terrible one. Um, Jobs are not disappearing because we're sending them to Mexico. It, they're disappearing because of technology. And that's a deeper, but it's not a nationalistic issue. And what you do about it, I don't think, is legislation. I think there are other solutions, but that's a much longer, longer topic. But yes, the connectivity as a human right or as a global response is at total odds with nationalism. And one thing I didn't mention uh, is that the jurisdiction of countries ends at 100 kilometers. After that, there's another body of law. And if you are using you know, uh, satellites that are up at that altitude, you are not subject to the laws, the telecommunication laws, even though they can outlaw it. You see, if you know something about satellites, you have to get what's called a landing license. But if I launch a few thousand satellites that are low Earth orbiting, I don't need a license. I just need to tell everybody in the world that if you stick your hand out, basically, with that thing, you're going to have 10 megabits both ways. The country can say you can't do it, but then they'll let it happen in rural parts, and in other words, it'll It'll, it'll happen over time, so you have to be, and while this wasn't directly your question, you have to be outside the jurisdiction of sovereign uh, interests. And that doesn't make me popular, but it's what you have to do. Yes, ma'am. Um, there are two uh, ladies with their hands up. Could I take the first one in the front? One in front first. <laughs> Sorry, it's my short-sightedness. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my name's Jerry. Um, I, I am very touched by this and, um, and the opportunity that you create for Africa through this um, concept through this movement in that you will be able to bypass um, government regimes and, and go straight to the African child and connect them to the global connectivity. Um, I want to ask 
what are the organizations that will allow this or allow the African children or uh, developing world children to become part of the global digitalization? What are the organizations that are allowing this and what are the organizations that are against this, restricting, just so we know? Oh, the entire telecommunications industry is against this. In fact, uh, every cell phone operator and every, you know, this is, this is heart attack material for them. Uh, and in the images I showed you of the chil children with the tablets, I'm counting on children being the agents of change. Now, to what degree, and I don't have an answer, to what degree can we make it such that if you get a recipe, you can build the device to connect it's with, with almost with chicken mesh and coat hangers. Uh, that certainly worked for receiving television. The question is getting a signal back. That's one question. And then the other is um, to what degree are there other natural things happening uh, in a country? There's many countries that I'm interested in don't even have postal systems. So how do you how do you connect? And it turns out that cell phones have done a pretty good job, and they've done a pretty good job uh, connecting people, and they're very proud of the average revenue per user, which is a very high proportion of the person's income, and they say that with pride versus embarrassment. It should be a thing. But that, is, that does prove that you can get things out, and maybe you can do it more virally than having an organization like UNICEF or somebody, though the United Nations is, is a pretty good partner and there are various different organizations within it and they don't have to go through customs and there's stuff you can do uh, through some of these large uh, NGOs like the United Nations. And so there are many, many partners. We're not going to go out and make little bilateral agreements with partners. That's you know, this, it, it has to happen more virally. Second row back in the gallery there. Hi, Nick. I'm a big fan of your work. Um, and I do agree that Apple is ruining, has a bad attitude towards the research community, at least in the technology sector. The marketing is doing well. Um, this is regarding a comment you made a few months back. Uh, you predicted in your book, um, being digital in 1995, that uh, digital sector will take over the world. And a few months back, you uh, said biotechnology is new digital. And we can totally agree to that. But what if I say uh, the predictable AI collision uh, with the biotech that's happening right now is a bad thing in the long run? Do you agree to that? Sorry, which one, AI or bio? the collision between AI and biotechnology? I, I don't think of things in terms of good and bad. I think of them, certain things actually are inevitable. So both of those are inevitable. Uh, I think what's happening, and I certainly didn't know it, Being Digital was written 25 years ago. So. You think of 25 years, there are some people in this room who weren't even born then, and it was talking about the digital world. What I didn't know then was that the mechanical world, if you want to call it that, would be able to go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and suddenly you find you're working down at a molecular level, which was really the province of biology and genes and the natural world, and suddenly, what I used to call a, you know, a man-made world or an artificial world is suddenly working at a scale below nature, below the natural world, or at least at the same level. The startling thing, which is interesting that your question asks both about AI and, and or at least mentioned both AI and bi biology, is that the natural world and the artificial world will be indistinguishable. Absolutely indistinguishable. Uh, and it's not that we're going to be informed by nature. It may be in places we do better. So it's, there, there, there's a real 
deep conceptual change that's happening right now because of the scale at which people work. And I don't think of it as good, bad, or anything. I think they're inevitable. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. Um, with the current political climate, particularly in the States, as well as the glorification monopolization of private companies, how would you suggest the removal of political control that the private companies, such as Apple or Google, for example, have within a country or nation? Sorry, that was a lot. Um. You know, the, the companies, whether it's Apple, Google, Facebook, I mean, I know them all and know them very well and know their founders and have watched them grow from like little babies. It's like knowing somebody, you know, as an infant and seeing them as an adult. And uh, it's, you know, I've watched it all and they do have an enormous impact on the economies and jobs and, and other things. So I don't want to be too dismissive. And if, if I were a head of state, I would probably listen to them uh, every bit as closely. But why we have, you know, Brexit, Trump, uh, other things happening is, is it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's not explainable. It just doesn't follow any explainable thing that I have seen in my life. And, uh, you know, in the case of, of Trump, it's truly not, like, there's just no explanation. And until 7 p.m. that evening, everybody was, you know, that this guy would never make it. So something's going on. Um, I'm not sure it's, it's collusion between companies and politics. And in some countries, especially small, dysfunctional, very poor countries, uh, the companies are doing, you know, a lot of good and doing sort of what the civic society should be doing if it were capable of it. So I don't want to be too dismissive about the corporations. Uh, yes, sir. Um, can the I? man in the cap there. Yes. Oh, yes, can I ask? For yeah, you're there, yeah. right. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Ahmed Ali. I'm, um, I'm a law student. Um, would you new think that um, giving laptops to everyone it actually conflicts with the human rights, as nowadays there's a lot of new technologies with the fingerprints and the cameras open, and even you've got these TVs that they can watch you when you're sitting with your family and everything, and there are a few cases that actually um, attack the human rights instead of helping. Well, <clears throat> you know, the flip answer is that Gutenberg didn't write the books. And the deeper answer is that I could take almost anything, including education, literacy allows you to write death threats or you know, do things, and you say, well, then people shouldn't be literate. And I think they have to be connected. They have to, I mean, to me, a laptop is synonymous with education. It's like primary education. So when people criticize the laptops and would say things like, kids need drinking water and medicine before they need a laptop. And I'd say, well, just substitute the word education, and then can you say the same sentence? The kids need education after they get drinking water. And it, no, they actually intertwine, and you want to have the education, because that actually may help drinking water and, and primary medicine. So I see laptops the same way. Now, does the connectivity uh, come with other issues and, uh, you know, privacy and all of that, and the answer is yes, it does. And awareness of that is the most important thing, not to try and eliminate the laptops or the connectivity. And, you know, I wouldn't for a moment try to make people unconnected because I think the risk of connectivity is high. And you can imagine the, the ethics of connectivity and, you know, the Vatican is really concerned about the ethics of it, perhaps more than I am, and uh, it's, a, it's a topic that's important and will be, you know, treated, but the solution is not to not do it, it's to do it right. Uh, are you going to do, shall we say, three more questions? That it's end? totally up to you. 
It's, uh, okay, well, we could go three on questions. Three I questions. imagine we could go on all night, and uh, okay. we'll have to ask you, persuade you to come back again, I think. Yes, uh, you, sir, at the back, then you, sir, and maybe someone from the other side. We there. have a young lady over Those here three. who's had her hand up for a long time. All right, second well, we, row balcony. Shall we make it four questions in that case? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for an amazing. Uh, where are, sorry, oh, where, oh, there you are. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, sir. Thank you for an amazing lecture. I'm a student studying MSEI with robotics. Mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, I do believe that uh, the AI field is booming at the moment. And uh, we will be using AI as a tool for connectivity in the near future. And in your opinion, what might be its consequence in view of the mission versus marketing, marketing concept? Well, the, first of all, Marvin Minsky died a little less than two years ago, and the term, the word AI was not used in public when he died. It, it's that recent that AI has fallen into the language and uh, is used as currently, and people sort of know what it is or what it isn't. Um, the, the consequence of AI and robotics to a large measure is completely in terms of what we call jobs today. And will working in 20 years from now be at all like working today? And when people criticize the various trends that are happening, they assume that work will stay constant, that we, that's what we do, we work. Well, first of all, everybody's gonna to live to 150, maybe 200 years old, and when you live to 150, 200 years, um, suddenly to go to school from the age five to 18 doesn't make much sense. You really, you know, it'll probably be very different. Um, I see no discussion about that. I never see in any article that people talk about the loss of jobs, to really rethink of it, think in terms of lifespans, how, what is the mixture? And we're gonna have to do a lot of rethinking about the concept of work, and that's gonna be prompted by the AI robotics uh, change that's happening pretty quickly. Yes, ma'am, you're quite right, you've been very patient. Hello, um, my name's Poppy, I study law in Japanese. Um, so just, do you study law in Japanese? And, and. And Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you worry that if the internet was free, that um, a lot of children growing up would spend a lot of their time indoors and might increase the risk of sort of social anxiety and obesity in children as they're growing up? Well, it's, that's a very interesting question. Um, there is a belief that if you're connected a lot, you are gonna be socially withdrawn. And yet there's a lot of evidence to the opposite, that kids, yeah, they're, they're, they're the outliers, but in general, kids who are connected are in fact much more gregarious and they have a lot of things to talk about, even if sometimes us adults think those things are not very uh, interesting or mature, they still are as, you know, it's, it's, it's not, there's, there's no antidote you need to get a kid outside or to get a kid to socialize. Um, but it, it is true that sitting is the new smoking, okay? And that sitting for a long time, for everybody, for all our adults, is not a great idea. And, uh, you know, obesity, I don't think comes so much from kids sitting, it comes from really bad food and a new affluence that occurs and in some cases a cultural belief that a fat child is a healthy child. So there are a lot of other things at play and I, I, I have a grandson who is glued to this stuff, glued to the iPad and the iPhone and so on, but he is the most gregarious social kid I've ever met and will go up to other kids and they talk, and sometimes they talk about their respective iPhones. So I'm, again, that's a sample of one. That's not, a, that's not perhaps statistically important, but I think it's part of a general, a general trend which is occurring more and more. I did see the other day um, uh, 
a couple pushing a pram with two babies in it. And I'm always, you know, because I think, I assume they're going to be twins in this thing. And I have twin brothers, I had a twin wife. I mean, I'm sort of fascinated by twins. And, and I, so I looked in the baby carriage and they weren't twins, but they were both, one was one and a half and one was two and a half. They were really young kids. And they were both sitting in their carriage with their iPhones as the parents were pushing. They were both going at it. And I thought, wow, that's a, that's a funny picture. So I don't, you know, I just hadn't seen that before. Right, we've got I'm two more. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And then perhaps the last one. Hi, I'm Anita. I'm a law student. As you propose your idea at the global level that everything will connect with the internet globally, does, don't you think that it can uh, possibly increase the threats on the national security? Because right now, whatever is happening, it's because of the almost of the cyber thing and if there is only one satellite which is going to control the whole program then it's going to not even all nations will allow that idea because they have national security issues not even all nations are connected with united nations because of this so how you will you are planning to propose this idea well there are very few nations that aren't part of the united nations but that's i mean there, there are a, a small handful but the association of national security risk with connectivity and you know globalism really I find so unbelievable. Um, you know, we we have somebody in Las Vegas who shoots the largest number of people ever shot in the United States. Uh, it, it's never happened at that scale before. And it, it's nothing to do with national security. Um, and if people are influenced by literature, as happened in New York a couple of days ago, it's, it's not a bore. The person had come quite recently, so it's the first time that you could say, well, this was a, you know, a, you know there was some kind of border problem. I don't think there is a border problem. And the notion of national security is, a, again, a funny, a funny concept because you have to believe in nationalism for it to be you know, a national uh, issue. And if you look at nations globally, roughly, whatever it is, just under 200 nations, they range in size from 1,000 is the smallest and 1.2 billion is the biggest. There's no taxonomy I can think of in the world that goes from 1,000 to 1.2 billion at, at sort of at one level. And whatever national security means, it's got to be different in the 1.2 billion category than it is in the 1,000. And so I don't think of it as the same way as, as maybe other people do. And I don't, I don't worry about national security uh, in that sense. Now, cyber war, which really can be done from anywhere, uh, is, or, you know, cybercrime is a very serious one. And uh, I have personally had a very large sum of money taken out of my bank account by some cyber criminals. Uh, and uh, they mostly succeeded. Some of it never came back. And you say, wow, that's, that's a vulnerability. You had it done to you. And uh, I did have it happen, but it still didn't change my attitude uh, toward it. And yes, I added one level of security to my Google account, but that's about the most I did. One final question, yes, sir. Uh, Peter Thomas, I work in mass communications in the School of Humanities. Um, from the activities of the, the biggest social media platforms, you could assume that they've actually skipped past the idea of connectivity as a human right and gone straight to the aim of making connectivity a compulsory activity, or at least something as, as addictive as crack cocaine, as they mm -hmm. see our cells, our sense of privacy, or as they call it, data, mm -hmm. as being the product that they sell to advertisers. What are your thoughts about any sort of potential global organisation's ability to actually protect our sense of selves from being sold to other people. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> this is where 
I'm very grateful to have <laughs> the Pope as a partner because he, uh, or not he, but the Pontifical Academy uh, started talking in terms of dignity. And I had thought that I had, I had thought that I had thought <laughs> that I, of all the angles, but I hadn't thought about it in that way. And I just listened to the various people around me discussing how this was an opportunity for more dignity and not having it escape into the files of Facebook in some way that you're a data point to which people then market things. And in places where there is nothing, there is no connectivity, the it's, it's not really assumed, and Facebook isn't interested in those places. So the 1.5 billion people who are the least connected uh, have a chance of, being, of viewing it in ways that are very different than you and I. And I watched kids in that village in Cambodia, albeit a long time ago, uh, cha change in many ways, including the fact that every single child in that picture went to university. And you say, wow, that's incredible. Why? Well, because they became passionate about learning. Did they then have, I haven't followed their lives, but did they then have, you know, lives that weren't interrupted by other things that, you know, are the misfortunes of life? I don't know. But the fact that they got the appetite for doing that, and it's innate in children. It's a, the, you know, the innate desire to learn and to play and to, through playing, learning so much from the ages of roughly zero to five, zero to six, you look at that body of knowledge that the kids gain and you, you sort of say, wow, shouldn't that go on? And for many kids, it's interrupted by school. And, uh, you know, can that change? Can it get better? Can it be different? So, yeah, the sense of self is a real issue, but I don't want to, again, I don't want to lose momentum doing it and become so circumspect that it's like the centipede who's been walking around very, very well and somebody says, which foot do you put forward first? And, suddenly it can't walk, and so you, you get into trouble. So That's not a great answer, but that's, it's, that's it's late. Sounded, and sounded I'm in a different good. time zone. So. Uh, Nicholas, uh, I knew this was going to be a stimulating evening, and you've exceeded my highest expectations, and I'm sure the high expectations that already existed in your audience. Um, it's been a, an absolutely extraordinary uh, Chancellor's Lecture this year, uh, you could have heard a pin drop during the course of your remarks. Um, I, uh, as a chancellor of, a, of an educational institution, your remarks about uh, the pernicious effects of school reminded me of uh, uh, an entry in Who's Who, which is, you know, a book of reference on of distinguished or so-called distinguished people in, in, in this country, uh, in which uh, one of the Sitwells described his uh, education as occurring in the holidays um, uh, in between terms at Eton. Uh, and uh, I can see that you and, and Sashi Sitwell were obviously uh, yeah. emotionally cl very close to each other. Uh, it's been uh, an extraordinary journey through uh, your imagination and, and breadth of vision. Uh, and uh, one of the things that one day I would love to discuss with you is what does happen to systems of government when they are overtaken by dramatic changes in society driven by technology? Uh, we've seen this, I suppose, with the invention of printing uh, 500, 600 years ago in this country, uh, in, in Germany and this country and elsewhere. Um, and we've seen it, I suppose, also with what happened in the 19, eight, late 18th and 19th centuries. We're seeing it in spades at the moment and how we adapt so that the people who um, uh, form part of the society uh, increasingly find that 
their institutions of government, uh, of government and those who, who, who people them uh, are caught increasingly f and obviously flat-footed by technological developments and the resulting changes in society. This I, seems to me to be an enormous challenge which will require radical cha changes in our systems of government. You alluded to this uh, a little sideways very often and sometimes more directly during the course of your remarks, but I hope one day that this is something that you will uh, address seriously for us more directly because it seems to me uh, that uh, those systems of government are going to be a serious challenge which will be developed probably by many of the younger people in this room over the coming uh, decades. Thank you for making the huge effort to come. Thank you for stimulating us in the way you have. And I just only rem it remains for me to say that uh, we have a habit on these evenings of at least trying to leave you with a, a memento of this place, uh, a, a piece of glass designed and produced by one of our graduates in our art school. And I hope you'll take it home with you to America. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.